Well, the Ruddle family has definitely had its share of close calls. So many, in fact, that this installment of what Phyllis thinks is close calls part two. <laughs> How you doing, Lisa? Pretty good. How about you? Absolutely great. I'm really excited about the entire show today. Okay. Well, I sometimes look at Dentistry Today news articles to see if I find something interesting. And I came across an article that I thought was interesting called Communication, Transparency, and Honesty, oh, wow. Three Keys to Great Leader Leadership. And it's by Dr. Roger P. Levin, who is a recognized expert in dental practice management and marketing. So I saw this and I thought, well, this is good for our show because if you ask any dentist if they w want aspire to be a great leader, most would say yes. But even if you don't want to be a great leader, you're kind of in a situation that demands it because being a dentist, you are by default the leader of your dental team and practice. So can they delegate leadership? <laughs> <laughs> the good news is, is that Dr. Levin said that most any dentist can become a good leader when emphasis is placed on these three things, communication, mm -hmm. honesty, and transparency. Yeah, uh, Roger Levin formed many years ago the Levin Group, and that's a practice management consulting firm. He's uh, helped thousands, tens of thousands of dentists and specialists alike. Um, we did something on this show, and I don't know which one it was, it doesn't matter, but we did uh, feature one of his articles, and it was interesting to me because it was like he was implying that maybe dentists are focusing too much on technical excellence and not enough on business excellence. And so uh, I thought that was very good because we want to be technically excellent, but obviously, you know, if you're not running the practice like Lizette said with leadership or you haven't delegated somebody to be a leader to be these things, you're not going to be the best you can be even if you have Leo Narchi, Leo, Leonardo da Vinci hands. So yeah, I thought that was pretty good and uh, I think uh, this article right here on leadership is very timely. Yeah, well he identified, and I'm going to say it again, communication, transparency, and honesty as the keys to great leadership. And we've talked a lot about about these things on our show. Maybe just remind our viewers really quickly why they're important. Well, communication, of course, is really the ticket. Uh, any problem I think that you've had or that I've had in almost anything in life, it's been failure to precisely and clearly uh, communicate and have clarity. So it should be a two-way street. We should have great communication, all be on the same page. Uh, transparency. I think just be open and honest. If you're going to do something different or they want to do something different, everybody at least knows through communication. Uh, but there's no secrets. There's no whispering. It's like everything should be open. That's a healthy team. Uh, if you have a problem with somebody, uh, there's ways and mechanisms to air that out in the time, right time and place. And then the last one, I guess you said, was uh, honesty. honesty. And I don't know if I should say a thing about that. Uh, honesty... I don't know if you're a dentist and you're not honest uh, with your staff, are you honest with your patients? So I would just think it's critically essential to, to be, uh, if you have to be even bluntly honest. Yeah, I mean, it's really important for you have to have that trust in the practice. You have to be able to tell the truth. Okay, well, we've also talked on our show about how early on in your career, you took a business course and it greatly influenced how you ran your practice over the years. And one aspect of this course was leadership. So maybe tell our viewers some behaviors or, or qualities that you think make good leaders. I think leaders have to be selfless. Uh, I think you should be willing, you and me should be willing to do anything we ask of anybody else in the office. And that's right down to toilets, okay? Cleaning the toilets. Clean the toilets, yep. 
and making sure the spree de corps is perfect. So be selfless and lead by example. Uh, on my notes here, I see we uh, leaders oftentimes, everybody has ideas. Show me who doesn't have an idea. But uh, float those ideas in a way that people on your team can grab it, embrace it. And uh, then let them run with it because it's way more powerful when somebody is uh, promoting their idea, they own it. And when you have ownership, you try even harder. So be willing to pass it around. You don't have to get, in fact, you, leaders should be kind of invisible a lot of times. Uh, put people in positions where they can thrive. You know, if you have a great chairside assistant, maybe she's not going to be somebody at the front desk that does uh, computer billing. So, Really get the right people in the right place and then grow them, send them maybe even to special courses because people want a future. Leaders create futures and futures give people possibility and possibility is access to infinity. So to the extent we have a happy team, an honest team, a transparent team, a good communication team, and we have access to infinity, geez, what can we not accomplish? Right. I mean, maybe it, it's recommended to have a little bit of a pleasant personality too so that that like leaders should maybe have some likability <laughs> well it, it's nice to be liked but i would have to say i might disagree respectfully with you because i can think of many great leaders vince lombardi was not necessarily liked right it just might actually be a little bit helpful it might make things a little easier if, if your staff can get along sure it does you. and a lot of people out there that are into donna's uh, just as an example understand how you might not have liked your mentor, but 10 years later, you loved your mentor. Mm -hmm. You worshiped your win. I, I, okay. Yes. Well, we've now talked about Dr. Levin's articles a couple times on our show, and I think he's written an enormous, I, I want to say over 4,000, and I don't think I'm exaggerating articles. It was thousands. He's, it's, definitely, he's written a lot. Maybe we should even have him sometime on our show as a guest. So. Excellent idea. And maybe we can all figure out how to make it work even better. Okay, well, we have a fun show for you today, so let's get going on it. Glad to be here with you today. Glad to talk about something related to endodontics. And in this case, we're going to talk about something very basic, working link determination. You might wonder why on the Ruddle Show... Uh, with the viewers being dominantly into dentist and general dentist, why would we talk about something so mundane? But we also have a lot of dental students. So whether you're a dental student, a well-trained general dentist, or an endodontist, let's look at working link determination and some of the factors because although we all do it, it might be the only thing we all have in common because we all do different things and we approach our work with different styles, we use different methods and techniques, different instruments, but we all learned working length. But working link doesn't mean the same. And as a teacher traveling the world, working link was all over the place if you start to really drill down and find out what do people really mean about working link. Well, of course, uh, besides the tools that we'll talk about shortly, the methods, uh, anatomical knowledge is going to be very helpful. As an example, the distal root of the lower molar, we know that the canal terminus bends frequently and ends on the distal aspect of the distal root in its apical one-third not at its radiographic apex. But yet we use a lot of slang and terms. I'm gonna to work to the apex. I'm gonna work uh, to the end of the root. I'm gonna work here. Okay, today we're gonna to clean a lot of that up, but having anatomic knowledge is important. I didn't put these other two in, but I'll write them right now. A lot of your working link determination depends on your philosophy of treatment. So you tell me where you went to school and I'll tell you your working length, okay? It's just really that kind of crazy. The other thing is, I mentioned it, terminology. Okay, got those big words written. Terminology. In other words, how you communicate in life, whether it's endo or with family or staff, is how it is. So communication, the words we use are critical because it conjures up pictures and everybody's mind doesn't have the same photo snapshot. So that's a little bit about working link and some of the philosophies behind it. But now let's look at the methods. And we have several methods. And of course, everybody knows about the importance of electronic apex locator. Most people are using them. Most people are on the latest generations that can work in electrolytes 
like sodium hypochlorite, or better yet, they work in viscous chelators like slide glide, pros lube, RC prep. These are the kinds of lubricants that help stabilize electronics. You might wonder what does gauge and tune even mean for some of you. It's a term I introduced back in the late 70s. Gauging was how big was the foramen and tuning was the clinical activity to validate the final file to link. So if a 20 was at length, each larger, successively bigger instrument uniformly stepped up and out of the canal. Then we knew the terminus was the diameter we really thought it was. That all has to do with working length. And then of course I talked about this and it was published later in time in Pathways of the Pulp, but paper point drawing, we'll get to that too, because that might be on the list one of the most accurate ways, but it happens late and you've already committed and the shape is already done. But paper point drawing is a poignant way to dial in and get another opinion, maybe a second, a third opinion on where is the actual vertical extent of this canal and where does it terminate? All right, so let's get going. This is a review and I'll go very quickly. We've done this many times on many shows before, but we've talked about the importance of pre-enlargement. And you can use anything you want. I use the auxiliary shaper from the ProTaper family. This is a uh, ProTaper uh, shaper and it has a big taper. Uh, it's appropriate taper, but it's confined to the body of the canal. But if you get a, a little room going, a little space, and you have a loose 10, then we know it'll accommodate the tip of the instrument and that instrument can follow the secured part of the canal, secured part of the canal, and then we can use this short of the secured part. So we just serve to remove canyons of restrictive dentin. Now be removing the restrictive dentin gives you a more direct path to the foramen, the terminus. That means working length's going to change. So the reason we're talking about pre-enlargement a very, very old concept because we have research that shows that working length and more curved canals can change up to one millimeter after pre-enlargement. So people working long rips and tears and causes post-operative problems, wet canals, bloody canals, surgical procedures, extractions, all that's needless. A lot of sixes and eights can be discarded. A lot of times you can discard them. Why? Because when you do pre-enlargement, Oftentimes, the file that would not go to length now will easily slide to length. And you know this if you've taken workshops. A lot of times you can take a 10 or a 15, even a 20 sometimes, and introduce it into the frame of posterior teeth. Oftentimes, that's common. It's normal, which means the frame is already that big. So when the file doesn't go down, we have to recognize it's binding in the body. It's binding in the body. That's an important concept. And we've talked about, again, the uh, advantages. I'm only going to focus right here. If we have an improvement in a pre-enlarged canal of determining working length, all apex locators, all radiographic images improve because bigger files are accepted to length. Oftentimes, pre-enlargement, you can put a size or two bigger to length. And that means our apex locators are more stable on the electronics, the digital readouts, that means when we take a film radiographically, we can see the radiopaque metal easier on a little bigger file, so we're more confident. So just a couple little things to be thinking about. And of course, you can review this old uh, chapter that we wrote to get more information on that. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this, and I want to talk about it in a little different way than you've maybe heard it before. Um, we were trained in Boston, this is shoulder driven, that where the file meets the edge of the root radiographically, say after me, radiographic terminus. Oftentimes the radiographic terminus, the files are exiting at positions other than the radiographic apex. So when you say you work to the radi radiographic apex, I smile inside, I know you're just kidding, but you don't really mean that, do you? You sometimes work to the radiographic apex, as I do and other endodontists, but oftentimes the position of the apex is not the same as the terminus. So let's clean up our terminology. Um, the main thing here is to talk about cementum. 
I don't even know if that's going to read, but we might just go to a different pen in case. Can't see. We'll bring our eyes to it. Cementum. So I'm depicting the cementum as this brown taupe color. Remember, it covers the roots and health. It comes through the anatomical foramen, and it moves up through the canal. And guess what? You were taught many times to work to the cemental enamel junction. And just to be really clear, you were taught to work to the cemental enamel junction. Well, what is that? Where is it? I'll tell you this very quickly. It's available to a histologist on a bench. It is not available to a clinician doing everyday endodontics. It's a grand idea to say, work to the CEJ, work to the constriction, work to the minor diameter. All these terminologies, oh my goodness, it's confusing me. So, Schilder said, since the invasion of cementum through the foramen is uneven, that means it extends up the walls, the internal walls of the terminal part of the canal, sometimes several millimeters, and sometimes only a few millimeters, and sometimes it'll just come in a few microns. So when your teacher and your textbooks say work to the constriction, work to the CEJ, it's an irrelevant landmark. And then if you talk about pulpitis and inflammatory conditions, you start getting some resorptions going and all of a sudden it's not a reproducible landmark. So Schilder said the only reproducible landmark from country to country, from state to state, from city to city, from doctor to doctor is the RT. And it can be all agreed upon around the world. So we know when we work to the RT, I want you to know that I know the file is minutely long. The file is to and minutely through the foramen. But importantly, at another time we'll come back and harp on patency, all canals are patent. And canals that are patent can be shaped. And canals that can be shaped can be cleaned and filled. Well, I'm having a lot of fun if I can get the eraser going. So let's continue. So you've seen part of this clip before, but not in this context. So as you work these files down, Notice in tighter canals and more curved canals, there's no space. So sodium hypochlorite should be obvious. It's inappropriate. There's gonna be almost nothing. Your chamber might be brim full. Watch us pluck a partial piece of pulp. Four peas, light them up. All right, and as you pluck out pulp, you're generating debris with the file. You're packing debris into tubules, into portions of cleaned out lateral canals, and so you can hear your apex beep, 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 but as those beeps get closer together, you're knowing you're arriving, and when you get a solid tone, and I mean right at the apex, that's where Ruddle works. Most of you want to work up in here by training. You'd like to be a little short, and we can talk about that histologically another time, but as a clinician, talking to clinicians who do everyday dentistry, including in the nights, we don't want to have problems. So working to the RT doesn't mean we're going to pack to the RT, but it means we have a flow channel where reagents can cycle and exchange into the deep lateral anatomy. So go to the apex. And that's the truth. Now, let's continue. When you get to length, don't leave length. Stay there. Hang out. Have a cup of coffee and work that instrument in, out, in, out, up, down, repeatedly, deliberately, intentionally, at length. And you're making sure every stroke, you're carrying more viscous chelator in, you're lubricating the file, and you're taking longer strokes now to see if the glide path is just over a millimeter or two, or do you have a nice slide path over the entire apical one-third? Listen, viscous chelators lubricate the file, they keep debris in suspension. We begin to uh, keep tissue from re-adhering to itself, emulsification. We've talked about all that. So if we don't work to the terminus and we work short, have you noticed, have all of you noticed around the world, when you work intentionally a little short at the beginning of the treatment visit, by the time you stepped over to the finish line and you took your last file out, oftentimes you were one to two millimeters shorter than you thought you wanted to be. Raise your hand out there if you have many times 
worked short and ended up even shorter than was your intention. That's because what? Debris begins to accumulate apical to the file. Debris, the debris begins to get packed. And if you're not clearing your framing with patency files, that debris will push the file back out of the canal and you'll lose vertical extent of treatment. So that's a little comment about working to the terminus to avoid blocks. What's an internal transportation? It's nothing more than what we say would be a ledge. So you like block, we'll bail this one out, block. So these happen every day. Now you have trouble with cone fit. Uh, you don't have a real good flow channel for irrigations. You're not gonna get the same physics, okay? So these are things to understand. So you're working to link to avoid iatrogenics. You're working to link to avoid transportations. An internal transportation is a ledge. An external transportation is moving the physiologic terminus on the external root surface to a new iatrogenic location, okay? This happens a lot. Where's cone fit? How do you dry these things? How do you pack into reversed apical architecture instead of positive capture zone? And finally, for those who are really, really uh, diligent and keep up that old you know, grind that file in, get that rubber stop back down on the chosen selected reference point because I don't want to lose working length. And now you have a great big what? You have a transportation and now we have a big perf. So please, no perfing. The secret is small, most flexible files are carried to length between every instrument just to make sure I'm still patent. I'm still patent. Everything's good. I'm still patent. You've seen this case before, but it's going to be a great example of all the things I just talked about. Let's take a look. I'm just going to show you a few snippets. It's a bridge abutment. You can see that, but it's a terminal abutment and it's the terminal abutment in the most venereal sense. Uh, probably has a furcation problem. You can see we have a neurovascular bundle traveling through here. We have root in proximity to that. So it's a very, very strategic tooth. So we're going to take the bridge off. That's another lesson, another time. And I'll grab a file and I've already done uh, uh, my access. And I want you to just notice working with, I have space. And if I have space, I can immediately use a more efficient tool. This is a auxiliary shaper, the SX from the ProTaper family of instruments. And in this case, I'm working dry so you can see what I'm doing. Notice I'm brushing away from purple danger. I'm brushing to the outer wall. I'm brushing to the greatest bulk of dentin. Okay, so you see debris. You see pulp hanging out of the isthmus. You see pieces of pulp extending. Isn't that something? We're not even close to clean, but I've got around the horn, I've opened up the body so I can get in here and begin working the apical one third. This 10 files about two stops short of my reference point. So I'm about two stops short and it's not moving. So I'm going to a smaller instrument. An eight is useful. So eight hundredths is better than a 10th. And I'm now picking, I got a little stick. It's tacky down there. And notice when I get about a stop short, it's a slide. I'm not doing this. Dentists around the world love to be screwing the instrument back and forth like a screw going into wood. It's a slide. And I'm working and I'm gonna reproduce the pathway. Now watch the finger. Just tap, tap, tap on your nose, tap, tap, tap. A loose eight already is a 10. So the 10 gets there quite easy and a loose 10 is already a 15. So learn how to use your smallest files deliberately, repeatedly, intentionally until they are loose at the radiographic terminus, terminus. Loose 10 at the terminus, isn't that a thing of beauty? So if you look, you can see the work upstairs in the body of the SX file. You can see we've done pre-enlargement. You can see by taking pressure off the file, we can now thread it around and see already, I'm a little longer than I might've thought, a little bit longer than I thought, about a, about a millimeter long. This might be a millimeter and a half to two millimeters long. And obviously I'm trying to demonstrate a path down to the apex. This is about knowing your anatomy. Remember that? Know your anatomy. So I'm gonna show this quickly. 
Why am I going to show this quickly? Because I want you to catch on that as we shape through multi-planar curvatures, working length progressively decreases. The astute clinician will reconfirm working length. So we can chuck up a pro glider, okay? That was before Ultimate came out with a slider, but it's much the same kind of idea. It's a different cross section, but only in a few seconds with a glide path it'll travel right to length. The stop kisses the selected reference point and kiss and say goodbye, we're out of there. But when we go to the film, I want you to know working length changes again. Look at that, it's now a little long again. I already adjusted. I was a one and a half, now I'm a half long. So be sure to reconfirm working length in longer, more curved and more calcific canals. It'll save you a lot of headaches. And of course, you've seen the post-op before. Ferkel canals, what we couldn't do because of my inabilities, my frailties to slide a file into that other branch, we could pick it up through irrigation and hydraulics during packing. So we're getting down towards the end and I wanted to show you this case. Uh, I take a lot of crowns off. Uh, I make teeth shorter, I like to work with 21s as an example instead of 31s. That's obvious to you. But the closer you are with your fingers to the length of the file with these zero dimensions of the instrument itself, the more tactile control, the more dexterity. So get the crown off if you want, I did. And of course, I'm gonna fill the pulp chamber once I've identified the orifices and I've done some pre-enlargement already off camera. That was in another movie. I'm gonna grab the 10 and the 10s going in, wiggle, 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 back and forth, little reciprocation, all right? And that'll draw the file down into the canal. Every time the handle is snug, pull. So wiggle, 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 that draws the file in. When the handle gets snug, I didn't say tight, snug, the blades are engaging, maybe two wall den, circumferential den, depends on the anatomy, the cross section but you're cutting on the outstroke. You're cutting away from length. You're cutting to the bigger diameters. That's safe. Don't cut in, cut out. Wiggle, wiggle, pull. That's one cutting cycle. Check it, check it. You know, I said, look at the apex of the previous case. Now I say, ask, is it true? So the fingers, when you're moving the file in, should match the electronics and the digital readout when you're pulling out, they should be in sync. And that confirms that everything is fine. So clear the foramen, and now I'll show you gauging and tuning. We talked about this in the early 80s. My last file of the length of the mechanical file was a 20. So is it a 20? We say, is it a 20? Is it true? Because Ruddle's off course 99% of the time. It's always those little adjustments that guide us back to take the path towards a successful conclusion. So every bigger file comes in, the assistant just reaches over the pliers, pushes the stop down, push the stop down. And if each larger file is uniformly backing out of the canal, I say, show me the shape. I say, show me the money. Okay, because this, this is just what we did. Okay, this means every dentist in the world has a mental picture of how the internal intaglio of that canal looks. You can imagine, you can't see the fins and the cross section, the lateral canals do this, but you definitely can see you have shape as you come away from the framing and your files confirm it because each larger instrument, the stop is moving progressively away from the bottom of the plastic handle. So that is a great way to say, do I have an accurate working length? Is it a 20, not only for the diameter, the gauging, how big is it, but do I have shape? But this is also gonna come back and help you confirm your working length. So you have the post-op, the crown's provisionalized, shapes are not remarkable. Maybe the shapes are a little smaller now uh, in this era, but uh, the principles of working length are absolutely the same. All right, paper point drawing. I've talked about a lot of this stuff 25, 30, and 40 years ago. I'm still talking about it because a lot of people don't know about it. But we fit, Ruddle fits the gutta percha master cone to the radiographic terminus because that verifies all the operative steps to date. But is that the terminus? See, I'm asking a lot of questions, aren't I? If I talk to my staff in the operatory, I'm usually asking questions because I want confirmations and validation. 
So the, is it true? Is it true? We're at, we'll take a film and confirm it. But that's not where we pack to. That's where we instrument. When we instrument to the RT, we're like the surgeon in medicine that makes a broad incision to include complete enucleation. They don't just take out the exact tumor. They make a little wider margin to make sure they got all the pathology. Working to the RT is to make sure you get all the all the pathological tissue out. It's to make sure you have a slide path. It's to make sure you have a flow channel. And it's to make sure we can be three-dimensional. So is it true? Bring in your paper points and start drying the canal. That part of the paper point that is clean, white, and dry clean white and dry is that part of the paper point that is inside the tooth. The part that spots, it could be an exudate of blood or it could be a serous or a purulent exudate, anything that spots on the end or the paper point at the distal end kind of accordions kind of collapses into your glove nail, that's beyond. So we will trim the master cone in accordance with paper point drawing so we can work to the physiologic terminus. How about that? This is the physiologic terminus. So we've talked about radiographic terminus, physiologic terminus, radiographic terminus. Whoa, there's a lot of things going on here. Radiographic apex. See, here's the radiographic apex. You don't work to the apex, you're working to the terminus, not the apex. You know, how you speak is how it is. And I've noticed that almost every problem I've ever had in my life is failure to precisely and concisely communicate. So maybe this will help you. And there's the reference. We talked about it all through the 80s, the paper point drying technique. And finally, we got into Pathways of the Pulp, and it was published in my chapter on obturation. So working length. What about working length? I guess you're learning it's more than just a number. It's more than just CEJ constriction, minor constriction, major constriction, terminus foramen. It's knowing the terminology, marrying the terminology with your philosophy of treatment, and bringing that all together with your anatomical skills and knowledge. And then with the right methods, you can discover an accurate and predictable, reproducible working length. Okay, so we started a Q&A a few shows ago on tips for using the microscope. And so we're going to continue it now. Ready to continue on? Continuing on. Okay. Slogging along. So question number four. I wear glasses. Should I be using my glasses with the microscope or will I feel less constricted if I just adjust the microscope focus to my poor eyesight? Very quickly. If you need uh, magnification or glasses for good vision and acuity, then you will wear your glasses into the operatory as per usual because the microscope can be adjusted. Uh, there's two little eyepieces and what they're called is cups. And if you screw the cups all the way in, then you can bring your glasses because see there's a gap between the focal point of your lens and your, your eyeglasses, and then you can see fine. On the contrary, if you do not wear glasses, the cup should be counterclockwise, screwed all the way out, and then you can come in with your glasses or your eyes to the cups wherever they are, and you'll see fine. But I guess you probably would want to wear your glasses because then if you look away from the microscope, you can sure. still uh, see around the room. I was saying to Lisa before we started that there's a lot of things going on in modern day operatories with assistance, and you're looking across to see that they have the mix right. You need to see. And then people come in, there's a note, you got to read. So I would say go into the operatory with your best vision, whatever that is, if you wear lenses, and then you're good. Now, what if you have somebody else that you work with in the office that also uses the microscope but might have different vision than you? Then do you have to just adjust it every time or do you? Well, now that's a little different question because uh, the first one's eyepieces and the cups, and that's for glasses, no glasses. If you have multiple uh, people using the same room, now you're talking about focal length and you have to par focal. So par focal would be different, I promise you, between me and you and even people that are 20-20 in both eyes might not have the same par focal. So par focal numbers, are, it's easy to do par focal. Um, you can Google it and do it. But you, the assistant would write that down or memorize it because I don't know how many doctors we're talking about to share the same scope. But in other words, part of the setup for the room is setting that doctor's par focal up. Okay. 
So I know it is a different question, but it's still a valid question. <laughs> well, that was probably even more important than the eyepieces. <laughs> okay. All right. Next question. My eyes seem like they are getting more tired now that I am regular, regularly using the microscope. Do you know why this might be and what do you recommend? Um, back in the day, and that means before microscopes were in dentistry, and I was trying to figure out how to work, um, I talked to a lot of physicians, and especially neurosurgeons that uh, use big microscopes, and I was more concerned in Googling their literature, would there be damage to my eyes? And it's really not going to damage your eyes, but if we work at too high of a power, too big of a mag, over periods of time versus just to go up in a big mag and take a look and then come back down where it's comfortable, that'll help fatigue and that'll offset and mitigate a lot of that. Also, if the those halogen lights, xenon uh, lights, they're bright. If you have too much light, that can be uh, hard on your eyes. Another thing is, is sometimes we used to cut the lights down in the operatory to have shadows and, and a little darker around the theater of activity and then really the good light right on the field. Okay. All right. I get everything focused and then the patient moves and I can't see. It feels like I am constantly refocusing. How do you deal with this? These were all my questions in the in the 80s. <laughs> Where were you in the Q&A? <laughs> well, you got to remember people are not asleep usually in dental offices and they are awake and conscious by design. And so they're gonna move a little bit. And if they don't move a little bit, they're gonna be doing, well, just breathing at nine X, you're gonna go in and out of focus. So you gotta realize your mouth mirror is fine focus. So like in baseball, we used to say, choke up on the bat. You know, you show a little heel, a little knob down here, choke up, get your bat around faster. Well, in dentistry, choke up on your mirror. So then you have a, two things to think about, a rest point. So you might put your ring finger down and you have a fulcrum or two fingers or whatever you do. Change your fulcrum, your fulcrum. By changing your fulcrum a half a tooth, they're right back in sharp focus. So you can kind of chase them around a little bit. Then you can let the mirror out a little bit or you can pull the mirror back a little bit, and that's fine focus. So the mirror took me about two years to figure that out. Mouth mirror is fine focus. Okay. Now, I'm probably taking one of your questions away. You also have pedals. I have pedals. Not everybody has pedals. Oh yes, I have a bicycle, I have pedals. No, <laughs> no, pedals on the floor to run the scope. So you have focus in, focus out. You, you can mag up, mag down so that it means your hands free so for a little extra money you can get cables that are you know out of sight and they're too plumbed in and then you have a little box at your feet like a rheostat and you can use these pedals or your assistants can use them okay my god these are a lot of tips okay what oh do you my god the tips are incredible today what do you prefer for your microscope a floor stand wall stand or a ceiling mount well i did all of those and i ended up on the ceiling so that should tell you everything uh get 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 your uh, sculpture are kind of big especially if you can get rid of the, the whole stand and the wheels then they they get smaller in their profile and their body so they can be hung on the wall like Lizette said, or on the ceiling. But uh, you might get a floor stand first because some people erroneously thinks, and I'm spreading misinformation, think that they'll wheel the scope from room to room to save money. And the scope will then always be in the wrong room. So suddenly you realize you need a second scope. And if you really get into this, you'll have a scope in every operatory. And it should probably be on the ceiling because the traffic patterns, whether you have dual entry in the back or single entry, people are walking through, patients, the staff, you know, even the patients uh, sometimes have with parents and adults are with them. So you keep your floor all open and it's just, a, you know, like chairs going back. You don't even look up there, do you? You just kind of fumble. How you doing, Mary? Yeah, everything's good today. You fumble around, you find that light and you pull the light in. Well, you just kind of fumble around. Look, there's a the scope. You just pull it in just like you pull in your old red light. I'm just wondering, like, say you have multiple operatories, would you get a microscope for every operatory, like at the beginning, or do you just get one to try out in one operatory, and then you decide whether or not you need to see for a particular case, whether you seat the patient in that operatory, or? Usually you have an operatory, and one's called no sight, and one's called <laughs> sight, and so when you seat your patients, 
They're seated according to whether you need to see or not. <laughs> no, if you believe that, you'll believe anything I tell you. Uh, you get one scope at first. That's great coaching because you don't know what you don't know. And it might not even be the scope. I mean, you might get enrolled in scopes, but maybe not that scope. So you don't want to invest in something that you don't really need or want or prefer something different. Get a scope and demonstrate you're going to use it. It really is going to change your life. You're going to have more fun. You're going to sit straighter. You're going to have lumbar support. You're going to have arm rest. Chairs change so you don't have to go like this all day. Your arms are rest. Pivot moves are what you're doing. And then if that's really working off, you'll go through the wall, the ceiling, the floor stand, and you'll know exactly, they will know exactly what's appropriate for them. And they'll get their second scope. So maybe you have like, I, I'm just wondering how you would place the patients in. Like maybe if you're just going to have a consultation, you might not need the microscope. So that patient would be in the operatory where there's no microscope. But then if you're going to actually do work, that patient's seated in that operatory with the microscope. That probably works if we say this. Uh, see, that was pretty thoughtful. Um, consultations, you're probably thinking, you're just reviewing stuff and you're going to speak to the patient. A lot of times you're doing diagnostic work so you can better speak to the patient and map out the more appropriate treatment plan. But maybe with transillumination, which isn't a microscope, we can have a lot of transillumination of, uh, there's different wands and stuff for diagnostic work. So maybe in a consult room, I would agree, you want it for working and looking, but maybe not in a consult room only, but you could do transillumination. Yeah, I, I guess you just would figure out a system that's working for you if you just start with one, but you're thinking maybe long down the line, you might want one in every operatory. Most everybody I know, and this is like since the 80s, the mid 80s when we got our first scope, almost every endodontist has them at some point in every room. Okay. All right. I think we have time for maybe uh, one quick question or, or a couple. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes notice glare issues that affect my documentation. Do you know why this is the case? And do you have any recommendation on how to fix this problem? Yeah, uh, <laughs> thanks. That's a great question. Uh, it, it really isn't a big problem for non-documenting people. So if you're not documenting, you usually don't have this. But if you're documenting, you're giving presentations or you're publishing uh, or going on the internet, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you might know streaks. You see these big bright streaks across your work and it drives you crazy. It's because you're getting glare off of metallic instruments. So what we do is we have them matted. In fact, I might have been the first guy in the world to have rubber dam clamps matted. And I've talked about it uh, publicly. Mm -hmm. And as so often the case, I always get a kick out of this, companies start making matted clamps. <laughs> So you don't have to go out to a machine shop and say, could you sandblast this? Because that would give it that uh, less than shiny look. Okay, well, I just want to um, remind our viewers that the inspiration for this Q&A on microscope tips um, came from the meeting you recently attended and lectured at the Academy of Microscope Enhanced Dentistry in San Diego. So do you have any like closing remarks about that meeting? Maybe any things you want to say to just close out on that meeting? Yeah, with big pleasure. Um, your friend, my friend, Sherilyn Sheets, Dr. Sheets at Newport, uh, runs the Newport Coast Oral Facial Institute. She would be a wonderful choice for you to go train. Her and Wu and Jacine Paquette, they run that Oral Facial Institute. They've run it for decades and thousands of people matriculate through there and they have basic instruction on how to use the microscope. John West teaches at IDEA. What is that? The International Dental uh, Education Academy, perhaps. Anyway, you can Google the acronym IDEA, south of San Francisco, just a few minutes. And they teach how to use the microscopes. And finally, I'd like to end by saying, Randy Shoup, Dr. Randy Shoup from Indiana. He was the president and is the current president of the AMED group. And uh, it was really great seeing all of his energy and passion with the colleagues. And, you know, he really believes in microscopes. He's a general dentist and he doesn't believe you should be doing. OK, this is in Ronald. Randy says you should not be touching a patient if you're a general dentist, unless you have a microscope. And that just came out on his radio show that I participated in last week. So thanks, Randy, for letting me be on your radio show. And the rest of you, you now know a little bit about how to integrate microscopes and you know where to go if we didn't get all your questions asked. 
All right. Well, thank you for the information and we'll see you next season for a Q&A. Okay, so throughout our lives, we sometimes experience close calls, and by that I mean a narrow brush with danger or disaster. Well, the Ruddle family has definitely had its share of close calls, so many, in fact, that this installment of what Phyllis thinks is Close Calls Part 2. <laughs> now, last season in Close Calls Part 1, The Learning Curve, we learned about a uh, little eight-year-old Phyllis getting stung by hornets, we talked about uh, near traffic misses, leaving kids in the car, kids wandering off, and dangerous relatives. I'm talking to you, Rosix. <laughs> so Ooh. this segment of what Phyllis thinks is going to be close calls part two, natural disasters, which is pretty self-explanatory. We're going to get Phyllis's insights on natural disasters, what happened, how it could have been worse, was anything learned, that sort of thing. Okay, okay ready? I'm ready. Okay, so let's start with tornadoes. Now, we currently live in California and we don't really worry about tornadoes here, but you haven't always lived in California. Why don't you tell us about the tornado that hit your family's farm when you were a kid in Michigan, is it? I was about six, I think. Okay. Yeah. So we lived on my grandpa's farm, my dad's family. Huge farm, dairy and crops and I don't know, 80, 100 acres. It was like a its own world and I remember in the summer every afternoon the ladies the older ladies would sit and rock on the big veranda thing and they'd say mm, it's tornado weather today it's tornado weather and nothing really ever happened but the sky would get weird and there'd be like a you know a stillness and mm. so us kids would hear that I love weather I have always my entire life loved weather it's never scared me lightning thunder all that stuff I have always been a huge fan of weather so I would listen to them and I think oh I wonder what a tornado is and so then this one afternoon the sky was getting more and more yellow and weird color and mm. all the birds stopped singing and it's like this stillness and I thought well, this is quite exciting. And they were just like, yeah, it's tor definitely tornado weather. And then all of a sudden it starts to rain a little bit and the wind sort of picks up and we decide, well, okay, we have to go inside. And then we're just in the kitchen and just whatever. And it's getting darker and darker. It's probably uh, mid afternoon. And my dad comes racing up the steps and the farm, the barn was probably a good maybe 200 yards away on the other side of the big driveway comes running and he hits the front door he says everybody to the basement and he had seen the tornado coming so we are headed all down to the basement we're on the stairway when it hits and it took off the front the whole front porch not the veranda we were sitting on but the front porch of the house by the living room we hear this big loud bang and we're I mean, it's like, I don't really remember what we did next, except we stayed in the basement for a while. But uh, the chickens were all gone. Never saw them again. The barn doors were gone, but the barn was fine. My dad had been up in the haymow looking out and watching the sky, because that's what everybody did in tornado countries, watch the sky. We didn't have sirens back then. And he saw it coming. And they kind of weave as they come down the road. He saw it and jumped out of the second story onto a pile of hay and hit the ground running to come to the house. Wow. So that was my excitement. I thought it was quite exciting. I think the adults were a bit traumatized. Well, like I said, we don't worry about tornadoes much in California, no. fortunately, but we do have earthquakes and fires a lot. <laughs> so would you rather worry about a tornado coming or would you rather worry about earthquakes and fires? My worst fear is earthquakes because you do not know period when they're coming and it doesn't matter if you're sitting in bed if you're sleeping don't I mean, the birds just, stop singing if it's during the day they do okay. they will stop singing it'll get quiet dogs know it's coming before humans do but usually you don't know that so earthquakes to me are like not natural Okay, well, why don't you tell us about the first pretty big earthquake that we were all in at the Arlington Movie Theater when me and Lori were kids? 
that was, we had moved here, might have been about two years in, into the late 70s we were here. I'd never been in an earthquake. I don't know if you had ever been in one. I don't think Montana. so. Montana. Oh, Montana, that's right, when you were a child. And so I had never been in an earthquake. Heard about them, saw them on movies, that sort of thing. So we go to a matinee in the afternoon, and uh, sitting there, I think we're 10 minutes into the movie in the Arlington, which is the oldest place in town, and all of a sudden, the rows are chair is kind of wiggling a little bit and all of a sudden it's moving more and more and I thought first I thought the truck's going by which makes no sense because it's a huge huge theater and then everything is moving and my first thought was save the children so I dive on to you two they're sitting between us and he's trying to get out of the row <laughs> And so we're colliding and chaos. I think I heard him out. scream every man for himself. I think that's no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was, I mean, it's dark. Everything is dark. The movie went off. We run out the side door, which you're never supposed to do because it was an old building with tile roof. And when we got out there, everybody's standing. And then we, we still didn't know what had happened. I'm thinking a bomb, something. And then the Safeway next door, the entire front glass window had blown out. And there was glass everywhere. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And then he had forgotten the keys. He had to go back in and get the car keys so we could get home. So, <laughs> Well, was... I should just say I never like to carry things in my pocket. Yes, that's true. So I was sitting on the car keys. So when we leaped up, because I didn't <laughs> think we should be caught in between rows, I was thinking we should get out. So anyway, the keys were where I had left them. So well, that was our big... That is definitely the biggest earthquake I remember being in. I think it was like five point something on the Richter scale. Yeah. But here's my next question for you. How do you react when there's an earthquake and how does it compare to expert recommendations? <laughs> I scream and run outside. <laughs> and that's I know you're supposed to get in a safe spot and I'm... For me, I just want to get out under the sky. I don't want to be around. I don't want to be inside. And I thought about that recently because I, I, I think I've gotten a little bit better. I usually cry too, but I've uh, the last couple of times I don't think I've cried. So. We, uh, I'll just chip. She hasn't gotten better. <laughs> Uh, she crumbles because, to the floor in a fetal position and cries. That's what I remember. <laughs> we, we we have quakes in town, as you know, but little they're ones. they're little ones. But they're if we're laying in bed reading the paper or something, and she feels a little shaking, you know, oh, she, my heart stops. She's like hysterical. So yeah. I always just say, "Yeah, you're right. Every man for himself." <laughs> now I want to go back now to something you were saying about tornado weather because I often hear you refer to earthquake weather. So why don't you describe to us what earthquake weather is? Anytime the weather is suddenly different or more still, that means to me, maybe it's from growing up in Michigan, I'm not sure, but that kind of says to me there's something coming. Something different is coming. And it might be a fire, might be an earthquake. We haven't had one for a while. So I think about that. But that's I relate to that stillness as being related to natural disasters. And it's kind of like the eye of the hurricane. I've never been in a hurricane, but I've always wanted to see how it is in the eye. Yeah, I've always kind of been fascinated with that whole concept right. of it being like so yes. quiet and calm. I know. All right, so is there any way to prepare for an earthquake, in your opinion? Keep your shoes handy. Don't run out barefooted. <laughs> That, that's the only thing I can say. Grab your phone and put your shoes on and run out the door. I still will head out the door. No okay. matter how prepared you are, yeah. it's still going to be a surprise. Yeah, and you have no idea if it's going to be a long one or a short one or what. The yeah, I know. That is something like sometimes they're just so rolling and they seem to last a long time. And sometimes it's more like a jolt. Right. Like, so. Yeah. Herky, herky. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on to fires because we don't have a lot of time. But um, <laughs> didn't you also have a home that burned down when you a were cabin. a cabin? Okay. It was our family cabin. And that was, uh, fires in Michigan were rare because we don't have forest fires. But this was the result of my uncle and his friends went deer hunting. And when they go out for the day, they hunt all day long, come back to the cabin at night. And it was in the winter. 
the snow. And so they packed the stove really tight with wood to keep the fire burning while they were gone and it exploded. Oh, okay. That's so, probably not recommended. No, <laughs> not recommended. It was a, quite a heartbreak for my, it was my mom's family that lost this big cabin and even the big pine trees, everything burned. It was very That's hard sad. to lose everything. I know. All right. Well, we have never had any of our homes burned down in Santa Barbara, but we have had to evacuate more than once. If you are told by authorities you need to evacuate, do you? I do. Him, not so much. So sometimes we are in different places for a short time. He yeah. has to stay and fight it. But I, I will leave. I don't see it. I mean, things are things. And you take your pets and go. Okay, yeah, I think that um, some of the footage we see of fires nowadays, it's not just like you could stand there with your hose and put it yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> Some fire storms now. Yeah, it's definitely changed. Okay, so with tornadoes and earthquakes, there can be a lot of devastation, but they pass quickly. Fires can burn for days and weeks. What do you find most difficult about having a fire burning nearby? Well, there's the insecurity, but it's mainly the air quality. Yeah, smoke that's, and ash. That's what I noticed living in Santa Barbara. We get, even if there's a fire in L.A., the way the winds come, it will affect our air here. And that's not good to breathe. And especially when there's house fires, when, you know, homes burn, there's so many chemicals and things nowadays. So I, I'm i concerned about air quality more than the ash. The ash is annoying, and you're not supposed to hose it into the sewer and stuff like that. After that last fire we had, the Thomas fire, and how it traveled almost like, I don't even know, like 20 miles overnight or something. Mm -hmm. It went so far in the night that that's kind of like, even now I feel like even if there's a fire burning and it seems like Anywhere. far away, yeah. it could come to us in the night. So yeah. that's like, mm -hmm. all Scary. right, well, that's about all we have time for. To close out, do you have any final thoughts or, or any advice you want to give viewers about dealing with natural disasters or just anything you want to say? I say enjoy them. <laughs> I love a good storm. I always have. I miss that in Santa Barbara. I don't count earthquakes. Those are not exciting for me. But just any, I just love weather. And I, I kind of follow my, the rest of my family lives in various parts of the country. And I follow the weather that happens in Michigan and Texas and the North Northwest and just enjoy it. Sit back and enjoy it. And Go An on. opportunity to mark yourself as safe on social media. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us for, I guess this is your eighth time doing what I those think things. So, so. Yes. And, I, and I do think, unlike what it says, does spell us thing. Well, yeah, the way that we have this set up, um, it's, I guess it, it looks like what... It looks like does Phil's thing because she her head does is blocked. Thing. Okay. Well, anyways, we're gonna fix that graphic. Very little thank you. All right. Well, thank you, and we'll see you next time on the Runnel Show. Thank you.